good morning and a very happy Sabbath to each of you. And welcome again to another Sabbath school in the house of the Lord. Have you had a good week? Have you had, well, I'm so glad that you have had a good week and the Lord has brought us together again. I want to welcome back Elder Johnny Saul, who has had a sabbatical. He's back with us this morning, all ready to go. And also, our pastor Royston Smith, who has had more than a sabbatical, and is back with us this morning. I have been tricked in putting them together. So they are back together, as you know, they are partners in crime, and so they're here this morning, and we're happy to have you back, Pastor Smith. He doesn't look amused at all. So thank you all so much, and those of you online, we welcome you, and we hope that you'll have a blessed Sabbath and a wonderful discussion. So if you would agree that Psalm 23 applies to you, join with me as we share this reading together about what our Good Shepherd does for us. Psalm 23, let's read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May his name be praised. Please stand for prayer. Father, we are so blessed that we can come to worship you. We thank you, dear Lord, for the breath of life. We thank you, dear God, for your tender mercies. We thank you, Father, for all you have done for us throughout the passes of this week, and you have brought us together in your holy sanctuary to worship you. Thank you, dear God. Guide us with those who will be leading out. Bless us, dear Father, and may your presence remain with us for Christ's sake. Amen. Good morning to one and all. It's wonderful to be back in the house of the Lord on a Sabbath morning to be able to study God's word. This is Croydon Sabbath School panel going out to you live on Today is the 7th of May. The time now is uh, 10 minutes past 3. 3 minutes past 10. 3 minutes past 10 <laughs> on uh, the Sabbath morning. That is uh, BST. Um, it's been nice to be able to sit back and to take in the lesson study um, that's been led so ably by Elder David Billet and his team over the last few weeks. But it's, we're back now to be able to discuss and to study God's word. If you're joining us from near or from far or in the congregation today, we want to give you a special welcome. So as you know, this is our lesson study time. If you don't have a quarterly as it's called, you'll see something on the screen telling you where you can download a copy to study today. A uh, special welcome to those in Radio Land, those listening today on Life Radio. We're happy to have you, and we want to hear from you, whether you're watching on live stream or YouTube or tuning in on the radio. We want to hear from you because it's an interactive Bible study today. So those on Life Radio, you get in touch with your, via your email, which is studio at liferadio.uk, and your WhatsApp number is 07311-409-409. And those on live stream and YouTube, you just send in your comments or questions in the chat as you would normally do. We have with us... Um, as well as pastor, we have panelists with us today. Let me start with our panelists and come back to pastor. So let me say good morning 
to Sister Rose Lynch Phillips, who is a multi-talented person today. She's a panelist for us. Good morning, Sister Rose. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. And we also with us have with us Brother Les Douglas. Good morning, Brother Les. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. It's good to be with you. Amen. So, Pastor Royston, Elder Valsey referred to us as partners in crime. I don't know what crime you've been up to, but um, I praise the Lord that I haven't been arrested for anything over the last few weeks. So let me say a big welcome to you. It's good to have you back in the chair, sir. It's nice to be back, Elder Johnny. I actually wrote the word out, partner in crime. Um, jealousy is a bad thing, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think, John, it's nice to be back. It's nice to be back with you. Um, you know, as you said, you know, observing and, and watching our members leading out, I mean, I was really blessed. Sometimes we have to just sit back and allow yes. the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. So it's nice to be back with you. It's nice to be back with Elder Valsi also. She doesn't believe it, but there you go. Indeed. Okay, so we want to dig into God's Word. So, Pastor, if you can lead us in prayer at this time. Lord, this is your Word. This is your time. It's not about us. It's about you. Mm. And so we have members sitting ready with their points to share. We have our worldwide audience ready to share as we dig into the roots of Abraham. May we learn something that will change our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So, we are now at lesson number six in our study of the book of Genesis, and today we're looking at the roots of Abraham. Now, our memory verse comes from Hebrews 11, verse 8, and I'm hoping there's someone in our congregation, if even they can't recite the memory verse, that could read it to us. Ah, Sister Renop, good morning to you. So, our, he our memory verse comes today from Hebrews 11, verse 8, if you can share that with us, please. And I'm repeating from the King James Version. And Abram. And by faith, Abram was called to go into a place which he should after receive for inheritance. And he obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sister Renock. So there we go. Let's try and uh, recite our memory verse each week. That will be your opportunity for those in the house to be able to repeat the memory verse. So following the events of the Tower of Babel, we now enter the middle section of the book of Genesis and an introduction to one of the great patriarchs in the book, obviously Abraham. Now, Pastor, although I don't really have green fingers from a gardening perspective, I do understand the importance of roots for plants, although they are actually hidden from sight when you think about it. So in your opinion, why was the lesson entitled The Roots of Abraham? Hmm. A very powerful question, Elder Johnny, about Abraham and, and roots. And like yourself, I am not into the business of planting. I, I enjoy eating, <laughs> um, as you can see based on my size. Um, but in terms of Ruth, Abraham, um, I'm just looking at Abraham as a person, looking at his history. Mm. Um, Abraham, you sh explore, ex you know, Abraham had a past, and he seems to have a future. Um, so I put Abraham in two tension. I call it a tension. The tension of the already and the tension of the not yet. So Abraham is referred to as a man of faith. Um, Faith mingled with, with, with action. God called him from what I've called heathenism and paganism and polytheism. Remember, he's from Mesopotamia, which is called Babylon, or in our present day, it's Iraq slash Iran. So there he was, living this kind of lifestyle. So basically, we can say that is his already roots. And then God called him, I mean, chapter 12. Of, of Genesis, dig deep into the call of um, Abraham by God. And then, listening to God, Abraham, a man of paganism, hedonism, and polytheism, many gods, suddenly became monotheistic um, in the belief of one God. And then, a man who was rich and fixed became a pilgrimage. The Greek, the Hebrew word is the word mak. Magurika, Magurika, one who is not happy um, 
with his current state, but one who becomes a pilgrim, one who travels, not by himself, but one who is traveling and who has been led by a spiritual force. So when we think about the root of Abraham, the roots of Abraham rather, you're thinking about a man who left his old lifestyle and embraced a new lifestyle. So his root is wrapped up and tied up. And as we go into the lesson, Elder John, you can see, even when he sinned, there was a tightness between him and God. And so he was rooted and grounded in God. Mm -hmm. Rooted and grounded in God. I like that. Do you agree with what Pastor said? What are your thoughts on the title for this week's lesson, The Roots of Abraham? Let's have your thoughts online and even in church as to the title of this week's lesson. While you're thinking about that, let's dig in. So Genesis 11 ends with the genealogy from Shem, the son of Noah, and verse 26 says, Terah begat Abraham. So Terah was the father of Abram. Let's get it right. So obviously at this point in time, he's known as Abram. In future lessons, I think next week we'll get into the chain from Abram to Abraham. So brother Les, if I can come to you first of all. Um, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. If you can share that and, and, and tell us what happens in these verses, please. Okay, um, I will be reading from the New King James Version, um, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 5. Verses 1, Now the Lord has said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from all your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curse you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, and they had gathered. And the people whom they had acquired in Haran and they departed to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. What I find quite interesting here is that within the first three verses of Genesis 12, God makes six promises to Abraham. But in order for him to get those promises, he needed to do something. And the six promises were that, first of all, God said, I will make you a great nation. Then he says, and I will bless you and another blessing, make your nation great, so that you will be a blessing. He then one says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. Now, in order for Abraham to get this blessing, he had to leave his homeland, his relatives, but also his heritage and all that he had come accustomed to. But also an important factor was Abraham also had to leave himself. There's a song that says, let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. And for, an, for God to, when God calls us for an assignment, for him able to work with us, there's an emptying that needs to take place, a clearing out, if you like, process. Something needs to be left behind. That Babylonian mentality, that way of thinking, the way of acting, that needed to be purified to enable him to embrace that God-centered way of thinking. So Abram had to leave everything that he'd become accustomed to. He had to go away from his home of Ur, of the Chaldeans, which is today southeast Turkey, and leave, going back to that word again, leaving his roots and never to return. Mm. Now, what I found interesting is that Abram was never told where he was going. He says, I will show you. It's not until verse 7, God actually says to him, I will promise to give you this land. And again, it's repeated in Genesis 17, verse 8. God said, I will give you and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. Mm -hmm. The whole land of Canaan will belong to you, your descendants, forever. With the promised child yet to be born, Abraham needed to move forward by faith. He needed to trust God, to, 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 to trust God's promise. So this was a movement by faith. 
you know, God didn't say to him, go north, south, east, or west. He mm. just simply said, I will show you. So this was a movement of faith. And, and, and I think, you know, as you said before, um, you know, Terah, his father, he was a worshiper of idols. So God mm. needed to move Abram away from the influence of his family. Although Abram wasn't a worshiper of um, idols, um, and we know this because um, I think it's, um, let's see if I can find it, I think it's Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, um, it says um, that, um, that you, God, called Abraham because he was faithful. Right. And we see that Abraham was faithful. So God needed to move him away to enable him to do what he wanted him to do. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you hinted on what follows next. Sister Rose, if I can come to you. Uh, what else does God say to Abram in verses 6 through to 9 of Genesis 12? And how does Abram respond as well? Okay, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the turbid tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, where he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still towards the south. So as Les has already said, we already see Abram uprooting himself from all that he knew, all that he trusted. And, you know, you say that you, you don't plant, but, you know, most of us know that if you uproot something and if you don't plant it back into solid soil, it will soon die. Mm. But God had promised Abram a land that he was going to give to him. And so Abram has now arrived at Canaan and God has verified him. This is where I have picked out for you. This is the land I have chosen. And we see where Abram being so faithful is now making an altar. Twice he made an altar to God, giving God the glory and you know, just showing his connection with God. We see that Abram had total dependence on God and although God had called him out of what we see was adulterous behavior he did not think twice about going the next thing that I noticed was that when he arrived in Canaan he realized that the Canaanites were still there but this didn't seem to phase him at all we see nothing of Abram, you know, mentioned, you know, saying, well, these people are still here, which is unlike the children of Israel when they arrived in Canaan, as, you know, we see in Numbers. They, they went out and they came back with negative news. Abram is showing unwavering faith in God. And so nothing, not even the people, were going to cause him any problem. Right. So Abram's attitude should be an example to us, especially in these times when we are faced with threats of pandemics and yes. wars and cost of living and everything. We need to remember that new experiences yes. can bring, can bring um, a, a special grounding with God. Mm. Abram had to uproot himself, but here we see that he was taking root in what God had said. He was trusting God, and that is where his strength was coming from. Amen. So we need to be saying that as, as we go along, not, Lord, I know not where I you lead, but I am trusting you, and I will remain totally faithful. We have to have that attitude as Abram did. Great, great. Thank you, Sister Rose. I'm learning about uh, husband uh, gardening or whatever, where you're uprooting and transplanting. Brother Les, anything to come back on from what Rose has just said? No, I just, just want to just, uh, just touch on a bit on in terms of altar. I've just got a bit of note here in terms of altar. Abram regularly built altars to God. 
and for two reasons. One was to worship, to pray and worship, but also as a reminder of God promised to bless him. Yes. Abraham couldn't survive spiritually without renewing his love for his loyalty to God. So by building altars, it helped Abraham to remember that God was the center of his life. Okay. And I just wanted to focus on that a little bit there. Good point. Thank you very much. So, Pastor, anything coming in online on the roots of Abraham or any other comments? Quite a lot, Elder Johnny, coming through. But let me say thanks to Elizabeth, who offered you and I some nice mangoes, kalaloos, and uh, banana. She says, come and I will share. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, we will, we're looking forward to that. But in terms of the lesson roots, um, Margaret says Ruth, roots enable us to grow faithfully uh, in God and to God in, in light of reflecting Abraham. Rodney Smith makes the same point, and Rodney seems to be the theologian online. Still there, Rodney. Nice to see you. Faith is acting upon the word of God, he says. Only Abraham moved by faith. Mm. I like what Nigel says. Nigel says... Um, when he thinks of Ruth, he, he, you know, his mind goes back to Genesis or, or the beginning, which is a very good idea they're sharing. And he says, as we look at the theme of the lesson, um, uh, it shows where Abraham began. So, you know, obviously, I think he's probably linking back that to the covenant, Elder Johnny, mm -hmm. that the lesson talks about. Um, somebody called Deborah Stewart online. I don't know what, I, don't, I can't see the point she's making at the moment. I hope, however, she will clarify as we, as we go on. Um, but, okay, here she makes a point. And I think you said next week we'll, we'll discuss that. So I, I don't want to go into that. She talks about the renaming of, um, of Abraham mm -hmm. and, and, and Sarai. So we will look at that next week. So I won't touch that. Um, Erlene over there, as usual, in Montreal says, Abraham was uprooted by God, not by himself. That's why his roots were so strong. And I find that to be very, very catharsis. Very powerful point. Um, Roots, somebody says, are the strongest, the most solid part of a foundation. And obviously, Abraham's root, root, I said roots, root, was grounded in God. Mm -hmm. Alana on live stream says, to have a relationship, I'm going to read this one, says, okay. to, to have a relationship with God, we have to leave where we are presently in the world. I want us to, I like that, to follow Jesus. Trusting and having a total dependence on him, who is, who is the truth, the way, and the life. To God. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful thought, Elder Johnny. I think she's summarizing what we should take from the lesson, yes. because that's what it means about Abraham being rooted and grounded in God. Great Some powerful points. points coming in, Elder Johnny. Great points. Keep them coming in. And congregation, we don't want you to be outdone by those online. So we want to hear your thoughts and your comments as well as we go through. Let me throw out another question to those listening in online, in church, or even on the radio. Now, some of you may have experienced leaving your homeland and entering the unknown, uh, maybe seeking a land flowing with milk and honey, or, or streets paved with gold, if you please. If, if not, you may have had to abandon a previous life to follow God's leading although unsure of the road ahead. What happened? Share your experience of where you may have had to abandon something in the past in terms of following God's leading. While you're thinking that, I think we have a comment from the congregation. Good morning, Mother. Good morning. Dealing with roots. And our sister mentioned about a plant. The root is the strength of the plant. From the root, the substance is observed, is observed, so that the plant could grow. If there is anything that will prevent this within the root, then it will not grow. Mm. And um, in studying the lesson of Abraham now, it being rooted and grounded in God, he gained his substance by the studying of God's word. His father, Terah, was not an idolater from beginning. He was not. But afterwards, he succumbed to that. But Abraham did not. He stuck with learning from God and wanted to please God. So the root I see there is the faith in God. 
by which we all need. It has been passed to us. Because when we remember the text says, we are saved by faith through Christ. And we know that the faith of Abraham was accounted by God for the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a reminder of the uh, message or the question that's on the floor. If you have ever had to abandon a previous life uh, to follow God's leading, um, although unsure of the road ahead, what happened, share your brief experience with us while you're thinking about that. So Abraham demonstrated great faith in the Lord. He didn't know where exactly he was going and what he would find when he got there, but he obeyed the voice of the Lord. So, Sister Rose, remind us what happened next when God's faithful servant um, moved. Well, you, you, you tell us. Genesis 12, verses 10 through to 14, please. Okay, still reading from the New King James Version, and it says, now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And, he, and it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore it will happen, when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. So you'd have noticed that I'd said before, in my first comment, that Abram had unwavering faith in God. Well, here we are seeing a different Abram, only one verse away. And what we see is that Abram left Canaan and went to Egypt because of the famine. But what we don't see was that God instructed him to do so. Also, we see Abram out of fear, instructing Sarai to lie about their relationship to prevent him from being killed. So let us compare here. When God directed Abram and he obeyed, he acted in faith without fear, took all he had, went to Canaan. However, when he acted on his own, which it appears he did when he moved to Egypt, lie and fear starts to set in. And so I just got a number of things from that. One was, none of us are, to are too holy to stray from God, and it can happen in a split second, as we can see. One minute, Abram is obeying God totally, next minute is moving in fear without any consultation or discussion apparently with God. But the next thing is we should be careful of the influences we have on those we love. Here we see him telling his wife to lie. Mm -hmm. You know, those closest to us can be the people who lead us into sin. We should not fear, we should not let fear cloud our perception of what is right. Um, he perceived what the Egyptians would do. Fear was taking hold of him. When we allow God to direct our steps, we can be sure that though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. So your question, Johnny, faithful servant, where was Abram's fate at this time? Mm. Mm. Oh, powerful, powerful, what can I say? Uh, Brother Les, let's continue the narrative and, and, and compare for us the integrity of a, a Pharaoh with that of Abram, verses 15 through to 20 of the same chapter, please. Okay, continuing with the King, New King James Version. Verse 15, the prince, princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with, with, a, with great plague because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you've done to me? 
Why do you, why did you not tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife, take her and go away. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent away with his wife and all that he had. So we have here, they're now in Egypt, and Sarai's beauty attracted the attention of Pharaoh, the ruler of the country. Sarah was taken as Abraham feared into Pharaoh's house, and many gifts were given to Abraham. Um, however, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with a great plague because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Now, this may seem quite puzzling when you think about it. After all, it was the king who was victim of Abraham Sarai's deceit. But the resolve of this punishment reveals the reason for it. When Pharaoh realized Sarai was Abraham's wife, he summoned Abraham and said, what is this that you have done? As we see, as we read earlier on, why did you not tell me? And he goes on to say, now here is your wife, then go. Now, the question could be asked, well, how did Pharaoh know that Sarai was Abraham's wife? Well, possibly um, he could have been told by Sarai when he summoned her to him, or God may have revealed something to him. Either way, when we think of the phrase, because of Sarai's Abraham's wife, that may literally be rendered upon the word of Sarai. So that's something there to think about there. But I believe he, if he had not known Sarai was the wife of Abraham, he would have had relations with her. But in the end, there's his integrity. Pharaoh returned Abraham and provided protection for him. Now, Pharaoh could have said, well, you know what, I'm Pharaoh. You know, I've got many in my harem. I'm going to keep it. But there was something there in terms of integrity that he saw that this was wrong and he returned Abraham's wife back to him. And not only that, but also protection. And in the end, when he returned, he provided protection for him. Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and they sent him away with his wife. Despite Abraham's wrongdoing, God worked to fulfill his promise. The Abraham... Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of grace. Yes. And here we see it. Abraham left Egypt with his wife, Sarai, the protection of God, and added prosperity. Interesting. Interesting thoughts. Sister Rose, let me just come back to you. Anything you want to add to, to, to that? The only thing I wanted to say was, here we see Abraham being uprooted again. And, you know, there is only so much trauma that... Um, a plant can take if you keep uprooting it and planting it somewhere else. The but, if you are planted in nice fertile soil, you will start to strive again. But the next thing was, we need to be mindful that there are times in life that we will reap great rewards through our sins, mm. but the end is always destruction, mm. as we can see. Um, Abram was reaping a lot of reward from Pharaoh, and but you know, he had to leave once that was found out. Satan's method usually is to lure us with trappings of riches and good life, but we need to remember that that does not ultimately lead to happiness. Yes. So let us look at the consequences of our actions because Abram's actions cause a lot of grief to Pharaoh. Indeed. Our actions can cause grief to others around us. Indeed. And let us not forget, and the thought has just gone out of my head. I'm sorry. That's I okay. That's okay. Mind. When I come back to you, I'm sure it'll come back to you. Before I go to Pastor, let me just take a, a comment from the congregation. Elder Pierre, good to see you here this morning, sir. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. As I'm thinking about this uh, part of the story between Abram and, and his wife, I think about Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Uh, I'm not going to read it for verse 9 through 10, but verse 10 is, is saying, For if two are better than one, I'm, I'm reading verse 10 now, For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, and but woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to help him up. And then this idea of help 
is going back to Genesis. God created Eve to be a help for, for Adam. I was expecting Sarai to be a help to Abram as Abram is misleading her. We want to choose a partner that is able to exhort us, that is able to challenge us, that is able to say no. I, don't, I want to praise Vashti at this time where she was able to say no to the king. Whenever you're telling me to do something that is contrary to the will of God, I have the authority to say no. We were expecting, sorry, to have that. Mm, interesting point, interesting point. Pastor, what's coming in online, please? I I'm going to counter what um, Pierre says, <laughs> because later on in the lesson, we might see it, where Sarai said to, said to Abraham, take my handmaid, Agar. Mm. We expect Abraham to say no, mm. just a thought. Mm. So they were both as good as each other. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, I know the point he was making. <laughs> right, I just love church. Right. So Elder John, you asked a question about leaving. Mm -hmm. um, we have Karen says she, sorry, let me just read a thought here. Um, Alana said she left her country 17 years ago. And she, she, her grandmother, you know, she had faith in her grandmother that when she said that her mother was going to care for her, um, that was going to be the case. Mm. Margaret says she left her husband 15 years ago, leaving behind certain lifestyle. Mm. Uh, and she said it was very hard. Mm. We have some very powerful testimony. I'm sure you know the next one is Andres Malcolm. Mm -hmm. He Carl said, he, yes, Pastor Andres. <laughs> um, I think he's my mother's pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said he left, um, here in England nine years ago, um, leave, leaving behind his, 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 his old lifestyle and, and going, and now he's a pastor there, and he said he's enjoying it. Amen. Uh, VK says um, she left one church for another church, and that's where she had her spiritual awakening. Um, DL said she left, or he said left, left home, following an ungodly way, but ended up at an Adventist college, which changed his or her life. Powerful testimony. Tom Tom, um, I think in Dudley says, um, he left Zimbabwe 20 years ago and he's about to go back in two years' time. Um, but he says, I'm still in the church and, and God, God has been good to me. Amen. Beth Blake said, I left my homeland 31 years ago to this cold country. <laughs> but thank God I didn't left my God and I'm still in church. Amen. Through the love of Christ who kept me under his wings. So there's a lot of people who said they have left places, but, uh, and it has been difficult and hard, but God, God has been amazing. Here's, a, here's an interesting comment, just based on what um, Pia said a while ago, Elder Pia says, um, Sarah at the age of 75 could still catch a man's eye. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 I just had to throw that one in, but here's a question, Elder Jody, coming in. Okay. Um, Nigel Archer wants to know the question. God sent Abraham, Abram rather, to Canaan a land flowing with milk and honey, but a, fa but a famine broke out there. What are we to think of this? Okay. Okay, let, let, let's try and just deal with that one quickly. So God sent Abram in a certain direction, and when he got there, it was not how he seemed. Um, some people coming over to this country expecting to see the streets paved with gold, expecting to be welcomed and expecting that everything that was promised before they, they, they left their homeland um, would have come about. However, as one of the people said online, despite coming to the, this country 31 years ago, she remembered who her God is and has continued to remember to who her God is. So in real terms, yes, we, we're following God's leading and suddenly we're in a place where it's not as comfortable as we, we were expecting it. In other words, there's a, there's a famine in the land. What should Abraham do? Now, the Bible doesn't record whether he consulted God before going to Egypt. But as we know, it was not God's plan for 
Abram and his household to go to Egypt. So I think that's what the, 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 I suppose the gist is there, that in this situation, what would we do? And as we know, this is about Abraham learning and growing in faith and learning from the, the various experiences. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Pastor. I mean, I was thinking it doesn't matter where you go. You will, you, you know, um, once you're in this world, you will always have famine. Yeah. Regardless of where God is leading you, mm. regardless of the fact that God is in control of your life, you're not immune from sicknesses, That's right. from challenges, from problems, from broken marriages, uh, from physical, personal, emotional harassment. You know, what keeps you is the faith that God gives to you. What sustains you is your relationship with God. And Cyril says it very well, and then back to you on the journey. When we serve God faithfully, he protects us. When we fall, he never removes his protection. So even though Abraham was in a land that was supposed to be flowing with, with milk and honey, and it had famine, mm. if Abraham had maintained his connection with God at that point, yes. uh, God would have fed him. Yes, yes, fair point, fair point. Okay, so if you're tuning in on Life Radio, this is Croydon Sabbath School panel coming out to you live. We want to hear from you as well. Here's another question. Looking at the question from the quarterly, Friday's lesson, it said, what is worse, lying or saying some truth while at the same time technically lying? As we knew, know, um, Sarai was Abraham's half-sister. So theoretically, when he said, you know, she is my sister, he was telling a half-truth, if there's such a thing. So again, here's my question. What is worse, lying or saying, that, or saying some truth while at the same time technically lying? I'd like to hear your thoughts and answers to that question. So while you're thinking, following Abraham's experience in Egypt with Pharaoh, we find him right back in Bethel where God had led him. In fact, at the very altar he built unto the Lord. But there was a problem. Brother Les, what happened? Genesis 13, verses 5 through to 12, please. Genesis 13. Okay. Genesis 12, sorry. Genesis 12. Go ahead. Genesis 13. 13, sorry. Yes, 13. We've gone into 13 now. I beg your pardon. Thank you. I will continue with the New King James Version. Verse 5, Lot also, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock, the Canaanites and the per Perizzites, then dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please, separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. Or, if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes, and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well, watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. Uh, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east and separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So here we see um, the blessings of God, really. Both Abram and Lot had so much blessings in terms of livestock that they're unable to inhabit the land together. So there was some dispute between each of those herdsmen. And Abraham, seeing his face in a potential conflict with his nephew Lot, took the initiative in settling dispute. Being the older person, he had the right to choose first. But his willingness to resolve this conflict, he gave, um, gave Lot the first choice, knowing the possibility of him being cheated under the circumstances. This was clearly a different Abraham from the one that we've seen going down to G Egypt. One who repented of those mistakes. This was now evident in how he dealt with Lot by allowing him to choose first, even if it meant not getting what he wanted. 
Abraham, the older person, could have chosen first. So it was in those days that was the the way it went. But what this showed was Lot's character. It, it, you know, his character is revealed here by the fact that the way he chose, um, he took the best share of the land, the whole Jordan Valley, even though it meant living near Sodom, a city he himself knew was um, a city of sin and wickedness. Lot moved to what appeared to be a very lush place in the Jordan Valley where he could easily have water to feed his flocks and left Abraham. In contrast, Abraham trusted God in whatever he was left with. Mm. Later on, we see here as a result of Lot's um, decision that Lot is left with his leaves with riches, but returns empty. Mm -hmm. I think the lesson here for us is that, you know, um, we need to be very careful when we make decisions that are only beneficial to ourselves. And we are not looking at how we can serve others and how we can help others. It's a case of, you know, there's a saying we have in, in our world that um, dog eat dog. <laughs> and, and, and that seems to be the mentality of Lot, you know. Um, so we see the situation. So, so this is what happens here. You know, Lot shows his true character and Abraham shows who he now has become as a result of who he was in Egypt. Okay. Thank you, Brother Les. Um, Sister Rose, to me, it looks like Abraham's got a bit of a bad deal here. Um, what happens in verses 14 through to 18 of chapter 13. Before I go on to that, um, Elder Johnny, can I just comment on the land of milk and honey? Go ahead. If we look carefully in chapter 12, God said nothing to Abram about where he was going. So he told him nothing about going to a land of milk and honey. However, Abram went anyway. When God spoke about land of milk and honey, this was when he was taking the children of Israel Correct. out of Egypt. And he said to them, I will take you in Exodus. Um, what bit of Exodus? I can't remember now. That's okay. Uh, sorry. But he said to them, let me just quickly, Exodus 3, 8. Mm-hmm. God said to them, um, I will take you out of slavery in Egypt to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So they knew some of what they were going to. Correct. Abram knew nothing, went anyway. The children of Israel knew what they were going to and complained all the way. Mm. Again, we see the faith that Abram had Mm. when he just listened to God, packed up and went. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I go now to chapter 13, 14 to 18, reading from the King James Version, it says, New King James Version, and it says, And the Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise. Walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. God was once again speaking to Abram and really, you know, repeating his promise to him. This is what I'm giving you. Look at it. Did Abram get a raw deal? Well, Lot was choo- when Lot was choosing, he might have felt he was getting the pick of the bunch. But God told Abram from the start, that he would bless him. We see God telling Abram again, walk the length and the width of the land. Mm. In other words, he's telling him, go on, take your claim, Mm. take position of this. There is nothing better than what God calls us to and what he blesses us with. When we trust God and when we lean on his word, he will do mighty things for us. And so was Abram getting a raw deal? No, he wasn't. You know, whatever is yours is yours. Mm. God will always take you to what he has promised. 
he never changes his word. And he's telling Abram here that on that land, you know, you just trust me and I will make your descendants so plentiful that if it was, if, if, if it was possible for anybody to, to count the dirt, then they would be able to count your descendants. Sure. So God was saying, I will bless you abundantly. Amen. 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 Powerful thoughts. Thank you, Sister Rose. Uh, Pastor, um, anything coming in? The question on the floor was, what is worse, lying or saying some truth while at the same time technically lying? <laughs> That's a very... Um, I'm kind of thinking of Partygate or Beergate. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> but but let's, let's, let's jump in. Let's, let me focus on, on, on the points made. Um, um, Karen says that... Um, when you tell a half-truth, you have to justify, find a reason why. But I, and on the flip side, I think she's saying when you tell the truth, you don't need to clarify, isn't it? That's right. Because it's the truth. A lot of points back to Genesis on live stream, on Genesis 3, how Satan twisted God's word. There you go. Um, and, 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 and this twistedness of God's word um, led, you know, for parents to sin. Um, Beth Blake says... Lying is lying. There's no half-truth. And D DL says, half-truth is about deception. Um, Erlene says, nothing, you, there's nothing called half-truth. A lie is a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. Uh, Rodney says, there was a greater truth. Um, in other words, yes, it was true that it was his wife, but the two had become one flesh. Um, so there was a greater truth. That was left. Um, he must increase, and, and Lydia says, no lies of the truth. I like the word, no lies of the truth. Um, it was a lie. Um, Michael says, lying lips, as we know, is, is what? Abomination. Is an abomination unto the Lord. Lord. So here's David. David made this point, and I wanted to read, I want to read a point made by David, Elizabeth, and Tom Tom. It was quickly fine. David. David Billet, I thought he was supposed to be preaching today. I thought he was in church. <laughs> um, God allows us to make decisions as Abraham did. However, Abraham could have been a witness of God, delivering him from Pharaoh. This could have given God the glory. Egypt's future was affected by Abraham's lie. Mm. Now, that's a powerful thought. And I think somebody says, um, our words have consequences. Yes. Tom Tom says, from a human perspective, deliberately telling a lie is far worse than being economic with the truth, mm. which is lying by non-disclosure. Mm. We didn't have a party. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> we can see this with our politicians, mm. you know, telling um, half-truth, right? It was only a beer. Um, Elizabeth Clark says, being truthful is the best way to go, even if it hurts someone's feeling. If you ask God how to go about saying something He'll put the right words yes. to say so it would, wouldn't, us, wouldn't hurt as much. Yes. Can I roll my thought into this, Elder John? Because briefly, I, sir. Briefly. I'm going to try and be as briefly as I cannot be brief, but let me try it. Um, God, God works in a very strange way. Because even though Abraham lied, God saved him. God saved his reputation. Mm. And who did God use? To transform Abraham, the heathen king mm -hmm. of Egypt. Mm -hmm. I, I thought about that, mm -hmm. that, that it was Abraham's faith. And come back to the, that's why the lesson is called the roots of Abraham. Mm -hmm. and, and I made this point in my lesson, and I was talking to Sharon about it as we had a conversation last night, that as people of faith, we will fall. Yes. We will fall. But when you're connected to God, God will protect you. Mm. Now, that's, that's one of the great mysteries mm. of God. And you can go through the Bible. David did the same thing. Um, a lot of our forefathers did the same thing. A lot of us in church, we have done the same thing. But God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. Yes. And yes. let me read this one, El Jordan, because um, Bailey's over there in... in um, in, um, in Spain, she says, deception and half-truth are common in society. Integrity is likely the single most important character trait you could ever embrace. That's right. The moral compass that ensures long-term happiness 
and success. I, I was watching Susanna Reed on, on TV. The first question she asked, she said to Boris, um, are you honest? Can people trust you? I think integrity does matter. Mm. For those of you who don't know, the Boris in question was our Prime Minister. Um, let me just take a comment from our congregation. Elder Pierre. Thank you so much. Uh, I thank Pastor for bouncing back to my uh, point uh, earlier. But the idea, maybe I, I didn't express it well. I am re I'm ready to be challenged. I want to be challenged if it's for my good. Yeah. Uh, now I, I'm seeing a different Abraham of, from Egypt to uh, Bethel. Bethel. It's the kind of Abraham that is really a spiritual leader. It's a kind of Abraham that is really uh, uh, setting the soul, uh, uh, giving us the guidance. Mm -hmm. We see Lot as being a, like a mentee, like a, a, a disciple, and Abraham is teaching him about grace, about uh, 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 analysis of conflict and resolution in mm -hmm. a peaceful way. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt was sort of a detour for Abraham. Mm -hmm. It was not part of God's plan, but we're glad to have Abraham back because of God's mercy That's right. and forgiveness. Even if we fall, Pastor mentioned that we can be back on track if you're willing to, uh, uh, to uh, repent. But still, the consequences yes. of our choices remain. The lie, and then of course, because Sarah could have said no, but she will suffer of the consequence of that, of that, of that choice as well. Agar in the future will be part of that consequence. But whenever we can challenge with love and mercy, let's do that for our children, for our spouse. But if we fall, we'll still find mercy. Amen. Thank you. Great point. Thank you. Let, let me go out with another question. So many of us today would never give first choice or do the right thing to the lots of this world. In other words, people showing the character of Abraham's uh, nephew, Lot. So knowing these people, you never give them the first choice. It's like, you know, I'm not even going to go there. If it, especially if it appears that we personally are going to be disadvantaged. So here's my question. What do you have to do to have the characteristic of Abraham in your life? Yeah? So where we meet day to day and we meet these people who we know are just needy takers, what do we have to do to have the characteristic of the Abram, post-Egypt, of the Abram, who then was able to display this, uh, you know, the, the, the humbleness and the integrity to his nephew? What do we have to do to have this characteristic in life? So I want to hear your thoughts and your comments on that question while you're thinking that through. Now, as we know, in the world today, there are nations that are at war with other nations, and some join uh, forces as, as a coalition. And this happened in biblical times as well. This was reported in Genesis 14. So Sister Rose, just, just if you can, list out briefly the, the nations uh, and coalitions of the war, um, and, and then if you can, just read Genesis 14, 10 through to 12, and just comment on that, please. So looking for the, 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 the makeup of the coalitions, and then Genesis 14, 10 to 12, please. Okay, so what we see Okay, um, we seem to have lost connection to Rose at the moment, Sister Rose. From the area of Canaan. Okay. And they were fighting against Ilam, Tidal, which is the king of nations, Sinar, and... Are you hearing me properly? Yes, no, carry on, we can hear you now, that's fine. Okay, so yeah, because I see there was an interruption. Yeah. And so they're all fighting against each other, which is quite interesting because they're fighting for land that effectively belonged to Abram. But we will get to that. Let me first read Genesis 14, 10 to 12, New King James Version that says, Now the valley of Sidon was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah 
and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Um, now, all these people, as I said, are fighting for a land that doesn't belong to them. The owner of the land, however, is living in peace. Amidst all of this fighting, Abram is living in peace and getting on. Lot, however, who effectively thought that he was getting the pick of the bunch when he chose, he is in the midst of all of this and taken captive. And you had asked earlier, did Abram get a raw deal? Well, now I'm beginning to think Lot, without realizing it, he was the one who got the raw deal. Or some people might say he was getting what he deserved. Because as Les had mentioned, Lot being his elder, um, Abram being his elder, you know, in their custom, should have gone and should have chosen first. And so you would think, you know, sometimes you're dealing with some people and uh, not that you don't intend it, you're honest with it, but you're, you're, you're being polite and saying to them, oh, do you want to do that? There are some people, as Les said, dog eat dog, who will not consider any of the customs or anything. They will just run roughshod over everything. Mm. You would have thought that when Lot, when Abram said to Lot, choose first, Lot out of respect would have said to him, well, no, as my elder, you go first. But he didn't. And so he said, you know, he ended up with what he had. You would have... So what we see then is that we can find peace in the storm. Abram did. We don't need to fight for anything. Abram got that land from God without fighting. We need to be careful where we choose to pitch our tent. Mm. Lot saw riches, everything. All that glitter is not gold. When he thought that he had struck the you know, pot of gold, it turned out that it was going to be his ultimate nightmare. Okay. We, need, we need to be very careful how we, where we root ourselves. Yes. Because basically, he rooted, Lot rooted himself in soil that was not very fertile. Oh, okay, good point. Now, you, you, you mentioned there Abraham did not have to fight. Um, Brother Les, in the interest of time, if you can summarize for us what happens then, verses 13 through to 17 of the same chapter. Okay, um, again, interest of time, I won't read through it, but just to summarize, we have a situation here where Lot now has found himself in a situation where he's been captive. Captive. And this news quickly reaches back to Abraham. Um, now, what I find interesting here is that we see the transformational change again of Abraham. Abraham could have said, well, you know what, Lot, you disrespected me. You chose. That was your choice. You suffered the consequences. But Abraham didn't take that. He didn't harbor any bad feelings towards Lot. In actual fact, what he did, he armed himself 300 of his trained men and pursued those four kings as far as, as Dan and conquer them and retrieve all the possessions that Lot had and, and, and came back to where he, he was. Now, it, it, on his, if you want to call it victory lap, if you like, over um, King Chedorlaomer, um, the king of Sodom, I believe, met him in the valley of Shav Shazer, I believe it's called. That was it. uh, and again, we see another situation here with, with interesting with Abraham. Um, that while Abraham was promised this land, here he was now in a war, battling. Yeah. And at no point God said to him that you're going to have to fight for this. But here he was um, fighting for, for this property. At the beginning, Abraham was not involved because he was in the highlands of, of the Jordan Valley. He had, he had not depended upon military might to take control of the land. Um, God had given him. In actual fact, Abraham, dwelling in this place, um, learned of, the, of the, 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 the sad news of, of Lot, and again, went and rescued 
um, seeking, after seeking God's counsel, he went to rescue his nephew. And again, going back to the fact this was an opportunity or possibly, you know, again, Lot could have just said, well, you know, you've made your bed, so lie in it. But he didn't have Abraham. that. It was a change in Abraham now from the one that yep. went into Egypt. And along, as we go along the story, we can see the change. And what that tells us is that no matter how godly you may feel you are, we will fall. But the beauty of it is, when Abraham fell, he didn't stay on the ground. He mm. got up. Yes. And he reconnected back with God. Yes. And that's what we need to recognize and need to do. When we fall, we get up again like a boxer. will not stay down, but we get up and reconnect back to God. Excellent. Thank you. Before I go to Pastor, let me just take a brief point from the floor. Yes. We are speaking of the same Abraham. Abraham who became Abraham. He did not ask God if he must go into Egypt, but he went anyway. As you read Patriarchs and Prophets, the king observed him with his wife. They were playing on the lawn. And there is where it was impressed upon him, this person is this man's wife, is not his sister. That covers that. Also, God called Abraham to go out. He did not call Lot. But seeing he looked after Lot since his brothers died, his brother died, or his Lot parents died, and he became his son in a way. His love for Lot made him, took him with him, and Lot was willing to go with his uncle because he has always obeyed his uncle's words. Mm -hmm. What his uncle said to him, that is what he did. So even when Father Abraham said to him, choose, he went on with the same manner of always obeying his Lord, his father, and doing what he says. Yes. There is much into this story. Abraham there represents the God of heaven. Yes. Lot chose not knowing what to expect at the end, God used the same father, Abraham, to release him from where he was, not only him, but others too, and all their belongings. There, Abraham didn't go as he did when he just picked up and went to Egypt. He consulted with God. In other words, I would like to go and release him. Is it all right? Should I go? God says yes. And the plan that Abraham put into operation was all the given, in the given um, knowledge from God. That's right. How he must work to think ev ev covert, do all that. Covert operation. Yes, whatever it is. And I must say this before I sit. Mm -hmm. Even coming back, when the king of Sodom said to him, all that has been captured is thine, you mm -hmm. take it. He said no. That's right. He did not. When the king of Salem came, when um, Melchizedek. Melchizedek came, he brought gifts of food because they will be hungry mm -hmm. so that they could eat and be refreshed wine and bread and so on, he brought it. Abraham in return gave tithe unto Melchizedek. Okay. And that is representing his thanksgiving to God for what has happened. Great, thank you. Yes, and also after that he offered sacrifices right. unto God, which he is accustomed doing. That's right. Sacrifices is thanksgiving and praise and uttered everything. Good. Thank you very I much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pastor, let me take some, a few comments from you briefly, please, sir. Briefly. Right. So um, there's a bit of conversation going on about if sin can be big or small. Margaret talks about it. Rodney talks about it. Bev, Bev Blake talks about it. But somebody remind that um, if your faith is as small as a mustard seed, mm. so therefore if your sin is as small as a mustard seed, so, you know, there, there goes the point about whether sin can be big or small, all sin will have 
consequences. And the church said amen for that. Um, or oh, the church said nothing. Oh, right. Okay. Elizabeth Clark talks about self-sacrifice and self-denial. The question that you raised, Elder Johnny, about um, treating people like, like, like Lot, giving him the, the mm. choice. Caroline says, we need, we need the Holy Spirit That's right. to enable us to put away selfishness. El Chico says we must be humble and, and learn about self-sacrifice. And she, he says that this can only be done in Christ. Erlene Samuel says we need to learn to die daily. Margaret says total dependency on God is needed. Michael CCJ says connection with God, grounded with God. Alana says we need to live a spirit-led life. Alana made a point. I'm going to read that point on live stream. She says, Abraham was possibly recovering, I like this, recovering from the humiliation of, deceit, of his deceit with Pharaoh and therefore was in a humbling state of mind, recognizing God's grace and God's mercy towards himself. True. And I'm going to add now, so he extended mm -hmm. that same grace and mercy to his greedy nephew, mm -hmm. um, Lot. Mm -hmm. And we should do the same thing to members who are not as gracious as we are. We need to learn how to be gracious. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Pastor. So, Brother Les, my, my mama already kind of stole your thunder. Um, although we, we have already studied um, about Melchizedek in the previous quarter, and I think when we did the covenant as well, so everybody should know. However, just, just going to you briefly, um, you know, your comments on who Melchizedek was, etc., and, and what happened there. Just briefly, your thoughts on that, please. Okay, um, yeah, so again, like um, Brother Johnny said, just for those who may not have been here last week in previous lessons, Melchizedek was a priest um, and a man who feared God. Now, what was unusual about um, Melchizedek was that he seemed to have come and just completely disappeared. Um, in Chronicles 31, verse 5, it says, Of Melchizedek, as soon as the order was given, the people of Israel brought gifts and finest corn, wine, olive oil, honey, other farm produce, and they also brought tithes and um, for everything to him. Now, being um, a priest, um, Ab here's Abraham in his glory moment, if you like, after triumph and defeating the army. And here he is, um, and Melchizedek appears and gives him food and wine. Now, if Abram had doubted at all his victory, it was Melchizedek, in fact, who set the record straight. As we see in verse 20, he says, And blessed be God the Most High, who has defeated your enemies. So Abraham then gives um, Melchizedek one-tenth of what he's recovered, which was a practice that dates back to Adam, if we, if we remember, where men were required to give gifts of religious, religious purposes. So in complying with this requirement, Adam gave one-tenth of in appreciation of God's mercies and his blessings to him, to Melchizedek. Now, what I found um, quite interesting here was that um, Adam, Abraham could have, because when he, when in a conversation with, with um, King of Sodom, King of Sodom basically said to him, you can keep everything, but just give me about my people. And Adam and Abraham, Abraham. I keep saying Adam because I'm yes. thinking about the, the time, mm -hmm. Abraham refused to do that. You know, he, he understood the, the greater picture. And, and, and what he wanted to ensure that, that, that the glory was given to God yes. and that in by, by not taking all the possession, yes. okay, that the attention would be not on him, but on God. Yes. Yeah, great points, and just in line with what my mum said as well. Was God, was God and not himself. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So we, we're right out of time. So Sister Rose, when, I, when you come to your final comments, happy for you to uh, put in anything you want on that point as well. But um, Pastor, let me um, take our final online comments before our panelists give their takeaway points, please. Uh, I mean, I think basically, Elder Johnny, um, I think there's this idea about who Melchizedek was or wasn't. Mm -hmm. Some say he was Jesus, some say he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Some say he probably was um, maybe Shem, the son of Noah. Um, but Noah, Abraham, that's 
quite a distance, isn't it? Mm. Um, so um, Rodney says, Shem was still alive when Abraham paid tithe. He, he most likely was Melchizedek. Um, th th there's quite a lot of um, points coming on about, but I think we did a lesson long ago about That's who... Right who Melchizedek was and who Melchizedek wasn't. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it go read the book of Hebrews, and it explains and it tells you who Melchizedek yeah. was. So that's just the point that is Great. coming through. Thank you very much. Sister Rose, let me take your takeaway point, please. Okay, so my takeaway point, I'm just going to say something briefly about Abram's rescue of Lot. We see in Genesis 14, 14, where it says, and when Abram heard his brother was taken ca captive, he went after him. So what that is saying is he wasn't even looking at him as his nephew, but as his brother. Mm. So yes, people, we are our brother's keeper. Yes. And when we look at what Abram did, he was willing to forgive, just like God is willing to forgive us. Like God, Abram went after Lot, took him out of sin, and brought him back to the promised land. So, yes. Thank you. It says in Romans 12, 18, as much, and I'm paraphrasing, Please. as much as possible, let us try to live at peace with all people, and let us be our brother's keeper. Thank you very much. And Brother Les. Um, I think my point would be, um, I think for me, was that to walk in faith, even when it seems unclear. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. I think for one of the things that stands out with Abraham was his willingness to follow God's instructions when they weren't specific. Um, and again, we see the similar occurrence when Abraham was told by God to take your son, Isaac. And so we see here God not only asking him to leave his heritage, but, but we hear it appears, so it appears that God is now saying to him to lose your future mm. by sacrificing your son. Um, so, yes, for me, so my first take point is to walk in faith, even though when it seems unclear. I think also the second thing for me would be be careful who we take advice from. As we see the advice he, he got from um, Sarah, his wife, that led to conflict. And I think while sometimes we may get advice that seems reasonable, um, we still need to take further counsel to make sure. Because as we can see, um, Sarai gave him one advice, which was really bad. And then later on, um, she gave him another advice regarding Hagar, okay. which but we'll, was sound advice. We will sound come to that. So you see, we still need to take counsel. I, and also my third thing would be the impossibility is always, in, the impossible isn't always impossible. Great. Genesis 18 verse 14 says, is anything too hard for God? When Abraham and Sarah got old, the impossibility of them having a child was set in their minds. Despite what happened, impossible what God said would happen, happened. Okay, let's leave it there because you're jumping far ahead. Thank you very much. Pastor, finally before Elder Valsi. All I can comes. say, um, when you're rooted in faith, you will be saved. Indeed. Indeed. Great points. Okay, as Elder Valsi gets to her point, this week we were talking about roots, R-O-O-T-S, but the R-O-U-T-E-S, the journey, the roots, let's make sure that we are traveling on the straight and narrow. Elder Valsi, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Elder Johnny and Pastor for leading us and those online in our Sabbath School discussion this morning. And thanks to those in the congregation who participated as well. May I invite you and encourage you to study for next week's lesson, God willing, the covenant with Abraham. I haven't got much of a takeaway point in the inches of time. It's just to say that I thank God that the world has moved on. So those of us who identify as women, would you say that you thank God that we are not living in those times? Women had no say. They were used as trophies. And also, whatever the husband said you had to do. Now, I am against women's lib, but at the same time, I think there should be some freedom where women are concerned. And where a man could just walk the street and just grab a woman and take her into his home and defy her, I find that very, very vile and very hard to understand. So I must say, I thank God we are living in these times where women have say. 
and we have freedom of speech. So thank you so much. I am putting on my PM hat at this moment, and may I just ask you please to, um, I just want to say thank those who participated in the quiz last Sabbath. A miracle took place, a miracle took place last week's Sabbath when we had that quiz. And the person's team that came second, I am still recovering from it. I couldn't understand how it happened. But you know, with God, all things are possible. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, so may I invite you to continue to read the book of Exodus as we meet again this, the last Sabbath of this month, which is the 28th, God willing, as we have our quiz on the book of Exodus. You know, when we study, when we read God's word, it's, it's fun as well when we come together to discuss it. It's learning and it's knowledge and it's fellowship as well. So please, may I encourage you to read the book of Exodus, register your team, there are teams of six, including the team leader, and come prepared for the quiz. I've made it quite clear that I will, I'm going to win on this time, God willing. And um, I'm a fierce competitor. I don't like to lose, so I'm going to prepare myself by the grace of God. So a special thank you to Sister Carla Moore, who is a volunteer in the, for the Personal Ministries. She got all the questions together. And Sister Nicola Copeland, who is the outreach and um, evangelism leader. She as well was very hard working into getting the things together to make it possible. And Elder Pete Price, whom we almost gave, turn him into a mental wreck because we were so competitive that the poor man almost had to go and change his way of life. But we thank God that everything went well. And I thank you to the AV team, those of you who came back to support us, Brother Herbie, Brother um, Ivan <laughs> Gervais, and the others who came to support us. So thank you very much. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. And come back again, God willing to fellowship one with another. Let's stand for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessed time we have spent with you. Without you, dear Lord, it would not have been possible. We thank you, dear Lord, for your holy words that we can study them and help, them to help us, Lord, to live out in our lives what we have studied and share with others as well. We are blessed, dear Father, to have all this information, but help us to use them wisely to your honest name and glory, for Christ's sake, amen. amen.